Genesis 4 is an important chapter that is often overlooked. It is meant to be the connecting section between the fall of humanity in chapter 3 and the prologue for the flood in chapter 6, and shows the continual fall of humanity and how evil we become within just a few generations. Genesis 4 begins by noting that Eve has brought forth two sons, Cain the older and Abel the younger. Both can be seen bringing offerings before God, possibly in a priestly role like their parents. Cain works the ground, similar to what his father did in the garden, which might imply he is carrying on his father's role as a priest over the land, and it would explain why Cain and his brother are bringing offerings to God. The text does not note these are sin offerings, which is probably why there is a lack of blood in the offering. They resemble more the idea of gifts offered to God, like grain offerings noted in Leviticus 2. These are seen as expressions of gratitude for God providing for them. This is why Cain brings produce of what he grew and Abel brings from his flock. However, the text notes Cain only brought some type of fruit, not his first fruits, but the younger son Abel specifically brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. The contrast is deliberately noting that Cain simply brought some type of fruit of his harvest, whereas the younger son, Abel, specifically selected the firstborn and brought it before God. In the ancient Near East, a custom known as primogeniture occurred, which was the custom that the firstborn son was to inherit the entire estate of his parents. However, interestingly enough, the book of Genesis spends a lot of time denouncing this practice along with polygamy. The Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament remarks, The stories of Abel and Cain, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and Reuben, Ephraim and Manassas, have some bearing on the subject and usually refer to a direct or indirect intervention of God. In their present form, these narratives are written for an audience which considers the laws of the firstborn to have full weight, and which therefore is fully aware of the tension between sacred history and present responsibility. From the diverse ideas and customs concerning the firstborn, which were present in the cultures around Israel, and in the beginning probably also in Israel, the Old Testament chooses that of the privileged position of the firstborn in the law and in the ritual of daily life, in preference to the principle of equal prospects for the great lines of history. In other words, within that culture, Cain was expected to receive special favor, being the older, but the author's example of Cain and Abel is noted on purpose to show that such cultural norms do not apply to God. He shows no favoritism based on birth order. God accepted Abel's gift because of where his heart was, not based on appearance. This example served to remind Israel that their destiny would be measured by their ethical behavior, not on being appointed as God's firstborn. This can be seen in how God responds to Cain by noting that he will be accepted along with his younger brother if he rejects sin. The response God gives is that it was not the offering itself for why God did not accept it, but the sin in Cain's heart. Perhaps it was the pride and arrogance of being the firstborn that resulted in Cain feeling like God should accept him over his younger brother. But God warns Cain that it is the sin in one's heart that God cares about not how offerings appear, cultural norms, or physical appearances. Kenneth Matthews says, Like his parents before him, Cain desired recognition that did not rightly belong to him. Pride dominates his lineage and is revisited among the men of renown in Noah's day and the later builders of Babel's tower. Beginning in Genesis 3 and carrying on, pride and self-centeredness disintegrates mankind into chaos and misery. What follows is that Cain does not listen to God's warning, that sin desires to destroy him, and instead, he allows his jealousy to overrule him, resulting in the murder of his brother. Cain carries out the serpent's role in murdering the seed of the woman and shows no remorse for what he has done. God begins by asking Cain where his brother is, perhaps giving him a chance to say the right thing or express remorse. And the verse alludes to the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, when God asked where they were. However, unlike Cain's father, who admitted to the crime, 
Cain continues to fall even further, by now not even admitting to the crime, lying, showing no remorse, and rhetorically asking if he has to be his brother's keeper. This is why God punishes Cain as he does. The Lord says, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. John Walton says, Since Cain denies responsibility for family, he is deprived of family. Cain has fallen further than his parents have, taking humanity one step further away from God. Cain is placed under a curse, which has the same meaning as it does in Genesis 3, meaning God has removed his protection and blessing over him. He is also exiled like his parents were. Adam and Eve were exiled from the sacred space of the garden, but Cain seems to be exiled even further than his parents were. Using a model of the encampment of Israel, with the tabernacle at the center, we can see this is like saying that Adam and Eve were exiled from the center tabernacle, where the presence of God resided, but they could still meet at the edge. Now Cain is exiled beyond the encampment, into the area of the wilderness. Cain, a farmer, will no longer be allowed to work the land he previously gained from, and is ostracized from the land of his birthright. Cain still does not show regret or remorse in his next response to God. His response is all about him, and not how his sin has damaged his family or relationship with God. There is not even an inclination of asking for forgiveness. Instead, he complains that his punishment is too harsh. Gerhard von Rod says, Under the weight of this curse, Cain goes to pieces, though not in remorse. The awan of which Cain speaks, in which he thinks himself unable to bear, is the punishment for sin. However, the passage still highlights the grace God offers, in spite of Cain's self-centeredness. God promises to offer protection over Cain's life, so no one will kill him as he killed his brother. This is probably a case of God trying to prevent more bloodshed, in an attempt to delay the fall of humanity into more sin and violence. The murder of Abel only made things worse. Humanity must realize the murder of Cain will not fix the problem of sin, but only contribute to it. Thus God gives Cain some sort of mark, so other people alive at that time would know not to resort to the low that Cain resorted to with Abel. The passage also indicates there were other people alive at this time that could have wanted to kill Cain out of anger for killing the son of the priest king Adam. God wants to stop this from happening and to stop more bloodshed and violence from dominating his people. Thus Cain leaves and goes to the land of Nod. Gerhard von Rod notes, Nod is probably a play on word for fugitive in verse 12. Cain is sent to a land of relentlessness. However, the exact geographical location is unknown. Perhaps it is a place further southeast in the Gulf Oasis or into the Zagros Mountains. However, the degradation of humanity doesn't end there, but spirals out of control as the descendants of Cain live on. The next section recounts the descendants of Cain, which reaches its peak in his descendant Lamech. The section begins by noting Cain built either a city or a fort, but the verse is ambiguous in the Hebrew. Matthew says, Although Cain built the city, it is for Enoch to inhabit, or as mentioned, the subject of the verb may be taken as Enoch, who then would be the first builder. The advantage of this latter interpretation is that Enoch is the nearer antecedent for the subject of the verb. This would make more sense since Cain was cursed to wander instead of just settling somewhere. However, Cain could have also simply built the city or fort for his son and descendants. After this, we sadly hear no more of Cain or what becomes of him. Instead, we read of how far his family has fallen. The genealogy reaches its lowest point in the seventh from Adam with Lamech, who unlike his forefather Cain, openly boasts of his murders. Adam sinned but felt remorse. Cain sinned and felt no remorse. By the time Lamech comes onto the scene, he not only murders, but openly gloats about it. This is setting the stage for what will follow in Genesis 6, when violence has covered the face of the earth. The example of Lamech shows that God's family has become so corrupt 
that the idea of murder has become a good thing in their eyes, instead of something to be detested. The example of Lamech was deemed to be so haunting and damaging that when Jesus came, he alluded to the boasting of Lamech in order to reverse it. Lamech seems to interpret God's mark on Cain not as a warning not to commit more murder, but as a badge of honor that is passed on to his descendants. Lamech seems to suggest if Cain's life for murder was worth a reprisal of seven times, then the murders he has committed should allot a reprisal of 77 times. The point is to show the degradation of humanity and the forgetting of the moral laws of God. God is being forgotten about by his people. Jesus, in Matthew 18, alludes to this passage when he says the purpose for his followers would be forgive 77 times, noting that the reverse of Lamech must begin in order to bring humanity back to Eden and back into the family of God. Lamech also begins another practice detested by God, polygamy. Like primogeniture, any time polygamy shows up in the book of Genesis, it is portrayed in a negative light that brings more pain and suffering onto the family. The Old Testament clearly communicates that the practice of having multiple wives was a departure from God's plan for marriage. This is conveyed not only in scripture verses that seem univocally to prohibit polygamy, but also from the sin and general disorder that polygamy produced in the lives of those who engage in this practice. For example, the Old Testament reports disruptive favoritism in the polygamous marriages of Jacob, Elkanah, and Rehoboam. In addition, jealousy was a recurrent problem between the competing wives of Abraham, Jacob, and Elkanah. Moreover, scripture reports that Solomon's foreign wives turn away his heart after other gods, a violation of the first commandment. And David's multiple marriages led to incest and murder among his progeny. Thus, in the example of Lamech, two detestable practices have begun to grow on the earth, murder and polygamy. Even though Cain's descendants are still producing culture and enjoying the blessing of subduing and rolling over the earth, they are producing a culture of death that oppressed women. However, a small sliver of hope remained. Genesis 4 ends by noting that Adam and Eve had a third son, Seth. The serpent won the first few rounds with the fall and Cain murdering the seed of the woman. But the war was not over. A glimpse of hope would remain and the new man got appointed to replace Abel. And mankind and Seth's descendants would have another chance. This genealogy is covered in the next chapter before the story continues. Genesis 5.